please uh, bow your heads with me as I pray. Father, thank you so much for the wonderful things that you are doing despite the hard things that are happening. We just ask that you would please help us to have a good picture of who you are. Wipe away anything that doesn't align with the truth that you are a good God, that you are a good, good Father. Please use me today. I pray that your words come out of me and that you would hide me behind your wings. In Jesus' name, amen. For the past two weeks, we have been looking at the big picture when it comes to who God is and what our relationship is with God. Now, Pastor Kendall... And and by the way, a shout out to Pastor Kendall. He's on annual leave. His uh, daughter's having a baby soon. He has walked us through a model considering what our relationship with God might be like. If we can get the up on the screen, that would be great. Wonderful. And this is the model. It's been developed by Pastor Ben Maxson, and it's, it's called the Lordship Model. And so just a quick summary of what he has taken us through in the last two weeks. Um, This looks at where we might be if we do have any kind of relationship with God. For those who um, are just considering God or reconsidering God and they haven't really put much commitment and they're just thinking about him, they might find themselves here in the dabbler area where there is low relationship. There's not really much performance happening at all. For those, however, who do choose to commit to him, there's two directions that they might go in. If their commitment tends to be focused on having a lot of performance, perhaps they have a feeling that I must do a lot of things for God to love me or to be accepted by him, they tend to head towards what is called a slave mentality, such as what um, Paul, when he was Saul, he had this kind of a mentality. And there's two ways you can look, either, either thinking a, a pharisaical way where how much do I have to do so I could be right with God? Or sometimes there's the other extreme that we don't tend to talk about much at church, which is actually still slave mentality, which is how little do I have to do to be accepted by God? That's not a really good place for us to, to be in because everything is, is hinged on our relationship with Christ. However, for those who do focus and put their commitment towards the relationship instead, they may have a child mindset. And with a child mindset, a good example is Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus while her sister Martha was busy in the kitchen. And Martha got annoyed with her, but Mary was just sitting and listening to Jesus. It's where there's not people who are in this mindset. They just love Jesus. They love God. They want to learn lots about him. Um, they, don't, they may not do very much, just like a child knows that their parents love them, but you don't really expect your child to do tons of work at home. This is a child mindset. But over time, a child grows up and they mature. And even though they know that they love their parents and they don't have to do anything to have the love of their parents... They may choose to, and hopefully they choose to respond to the love and actually do things to help their parents. And this is a partner-friend mindset um, with our lordship model. We hope that even though we might have a great relationship with God, we know that Jesus loves us, we don't have to do anything to be loved by God. However, we respond to God saying, you've accepted me, you love me no matter what. What can I do to help you, Lord? And this is our, our, our partner-friend mentality where there is a high relationship and there is also high performance. Now, being God's partner means that you have an awareness of his presence in his life. This isn't working. If someone at the back could hit the button, please. Thank you. You have an awareness of his presence in your life and you can sense God's guidance in your life. In other words, it's a real sense of oneness with God. But having a sense of oneness with God, it requires having an awareness of his presence. 
So if we are to get to the point, as his partner friends, what tends to take place is that we know where God is, we know where he's leading us, but we first must have an understanding of his presence. But having an understanding and a sense of God's presence requires a solid understanding of what it means for Jesus to be our Lord. And so we have lordship is required to get to that place. And lordship meaning that we submit to God's will. Not because we have to, to be accepted by him, but because we choose to have him as our God. This is not just regarding the, the law, but it's also regarding the other aspects of our life where we might sense that he's leading us. But having a submission to God requires two things specifically. Number one, understanding that Jesus has saved us. And number two, accepting that he has saved us. In other words, it's allowing the gospel to change us into new creatures in Christ. But finally, our perception of salvation, it must first come from our picture of God. Now, we're going to be talking over the next four weeks of each of these aspects because they help us to become aware of God in our life and knowing where he is guiding us. What is our picture of God? What is he really like? What does he think of us? This week, we're going to start our journey by contemplating what our vision of God is. Now, the Bible gives us many different visions of God. But today, we are going to look at three specific visions that can be found in the New Testament. Now, I want you to picture this story with me. One morning, as Jesus was teaching in the temple grounds, in the courtroom outside of it, a shriek was heard. Please, no, it wasn't my fault. Please have mercy on me. Lord, help me. And a group of men, most of whom were religious teachers, pushed their way through the crowd surrounding Jesus. And behind them was another group of religious men who were holding and dragging a woman wearing nothing but a bedsheet that she had grabbed as she was ripped from her bed. And the woman was thrown down in front of Jesus naked. And with a show of false pity, one of the men threw the ripped sheet on top of her as she held herself in the fetal position and sobbed with her face in the dirt. Jesus knelt down and he put a gentle hand on the woman's shoulder. I wouldn't touch her if I were you, teacher Jesus, one of the Pharisees said. You will not find a more unclean woman in all of Judea. She has been caught in the act of adultery. Jesus looked up at the callous men, knowing full well their intent. And looking to the crowd of people around him, a Pharisee yelled, Everyone here is well aware of what the law of Moses says. Quietly and quickly, the woman, looking around at the mob, whimpered, where is the man who is with me? And suddenly a man approached the woman and slapped her with the back of his hand with full force. You are in no position to speak, woman. Loudly the woman cried, holding her bruised face. And again she buried her face in the dirt. And with anguish, Jesus looked at the woman as though he had just been hit himself, feeling the same pain that she had received. The law of Moses plainly says that such a woman should be stoned. And the woman sobbed uncontrollably as many of the men began to call out, Stone her! Stone her! And they began to pick up large stones. And holding up a hand to quiet the mob, a finely dressed Pharisee stepped forward and said, This is what Moses says, teacher. What do you say? All were silent. 
as they waited for Jesus to respond. Now, if Jesus told the men not to stone the woman, they could accuse Jesus of changing the law of Moses, which would result either in his death or, at the very least, it would ruin his credibility. But if Jesus told them to do what Moses said, they could then tell the Roman authorities that Jesus had ordered the death of a person, which was something that only the governing Romans were allowed to do. This again would result in his death, or at the very least, his imprisonment. But Jesus didn't care about either of these two things. Jesus looked at the woman with pity. And then he looked up at the man who asked the question. And the eyes of Jesus saw through the man's intention. And the man could not bear looking into the face of Jesus for too long. And he lowered his head and he stepped back into the crowd. And as the woman continued to sob, Jesus knelt down and began to write words in the dust. Puzzled, another man spoke out saying, What do you say, Jesus? Jesus paused his writing, and he looked up at the mob and said, The law of Moses is clear about this punishment, but whoever is sinless, let them throw the first stone. And looking back down, Jesus continued to write in the dust. And a couple of older men with stones in their hand approached the woman ready to stone her and then stopped. Something that Jesus was writing caught their attention. And they leaned down to look closer and then wide eyes and, and gasping, they quickly walked into the crowd and disappeared. Nodding knowingly, after the men had left, Jesus wiped away what was written and he began writing new words into the dust. And confused by the fleeing men, others came forward just as the previous two and again they looked down at what Jesus was writing. Shocked to see what was written, they too dispersed into the crowd and disappeared. As Jesus continued to erase what was written and then write down more as each new onlooker came. And though the Bible doesn't specifically say, we can assume that Jesus was writing down the personal sin of each accuser. There is not one accuser who was himself sinless, and none after witnessing their own name next to a sin would dare declare otherwise. And before long, only the original crowd of people who were there to learn from Jesus were left. But through all this, the woman had continued to sob, oblivious to what had taken place, believing that at any moment, her life was to come to a painful and humiliating end. But Jesus stood up, and he walked over to the shivering woman, and he, he took off his outer robe and covered the woman, covering up her nakedness. And then I imagine Jesus sat down next to her in the dust. And putting a hand on her shoulder, he whispered to her, My daughter, open your eyes. Look around you. And feeling the coat on her and the tender words of Jesus stirred her out of her misery and she looked up and wiped the tears out of her eyes. Where are the men who accused you? Is there no one here to condemn you? Looking around in shocked realization, the woman replied with confusion. No, they're gone, Lord. Standing up, Jesus took the woman's hand and helped her up. And just as if a child had fallen down and stumbled into the, the dirt. Jesus went up to her and wiped the dust and the dirt and the blood and the tears from her face. And he looked into her face 
with a smile beaming. And he said to her, I will not condemn you either. Go and sin no more, my child. No one knew the law better than Jesus did. As he was God, he was the one who gave the law to Moses in the first place. So why did Jesus not follow through in stoning this woman? He had been there to help put the laws together. We can find that there's many different reasons why he didn't, but we're going to focus on the main reason. We can find this answer in a conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, who is called a teacher of teacher of the Pharisees. This is in John chapter 3, 17. And Jesus said, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You see, Jesus was well aware of what the woman had done. She, he knew that she had broken the law that he created. He didn't say that she didn't do anything wrong. According to the same law, she deserved death. But Jesus did not come into the world to judge it, but to save it. Often people think of God as this distant and angry God who disapprovingly looks down at everyone, especially whenever they do anything wrong, who's ready to hurl judgment at anyone who sins. But in John chapter 8, we have this picture of Jesus who is defending a woman who was caught in the act of infidelity by their local church board. Jesus isn't taking sides with the religious people. We often think he, think he does. He's actually defending a sinner. In this snapshot, we get a picture of God as the defender of sinners. Not the one who points his finger at them. But let's move the timeline a little bit. This same son of God who was defending a sinner is now pictured being lifted high on a rough wooden cross. He's been beaten and whipped. He's been mocked. He's been given two unfair trials supported by the priestly and ruling class. He's been denied and abandoned by most of his followers and friends. He's been sentenced to die in the most cruel manner of the time for no crime except for claiming that he was the Son of God. He's then made to carry a heavy cross naked through the city of Jerusalem. Think about that. Even if he didn't die, if someone endured that, they'd probably want to by the end. And whilst, all the while his blood dripped all over the ground wherever he went. Then he's pushed down onto a splintered piece of wood and nailed to it in a way that made it incredibly painful to breathe. And then he was, he was mocked once again. He was mocked beforehand. He was mocked during. He was, he was mocked after. He was hung naked in an amount of physical and spiritual pain that none of us could ever imagine. We've all been through really difficult things in our lives. I'm sure of it. But none of it comes close to what he went through. And all through this awful and terrible ordeal, Jesus is pleading with his Father in heaven, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. If it was me, I don't think I could say that. I would think that they do know what they're doing. And I would have a hard time forgiving them. But this is Jesus. This is, this is God saying this. Even as he is being slowly killed and tortured in real time 
by conniving murderers, Jesus is still defending them. He's still defending sinners. This time he's defending sinners who are currently sinning against him. Is this a picture of a judging and angry God? This time, he's not only defending sinners like the woman who committed adultery. He's now defending sinners as they murder him. This time, it's not just defending. This time, God is exchanging his own life as the sinless and all-powerful being for the life of every sinner who would ever live. Dying for every murderer, every liar, every dictator, everyone who stole, everyone who had any dark thought in their head, anyone who messed up like us. He's dying for every rapist, for every kind of sinner, for the big ones, for the small ones. He's dying for both those who love him And he's also dying for those who despise him. He's dying and giving up his life for even those who are he knows are going to choose to deny him and are who are not going to want to acceptance. He's pouring out his life so that even those who sin, even the worst sinners in history, even me, a sinner, even you, a sinner, can be given the opportunity to live forever. God the Father offering up his own son so that he can bring his other children home. And God the Son giving up his life For his sinful brothers and sisters. What kind of a picture. What kind of a vision. Do you have of God. When you think of how he defends. Us when we fall. And how he gives up. Even his own life. So that we might be with him. He gives a. An answer to this in the exact same conversation that I mentioned earlier with Nicodemus. Just one verse before. It's a verse that I think most people know. Even those who aren't Christian may know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave up his only son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Let's move the timeline even further now. Now, the previous two pictures came from John the disciple. This last one is also penned by John at the end of his life, when he was alone on the island of Patmos after almost all of his friends had died. John was given a vision of Jesus And John describes what happens when he actually sees Jesus. He sees Jesus risen from the dead, transfigured. And he comes to him in Revelation 1, verses 13 to 18. And he says, talking about Jesus, He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, this is John speaking, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and last. I am the living one. I died. But look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. So the resurrected Jesus is an amazing and terrifying sight to behold according to John's description. 
he not only looked like a glowing superhero, but he's described as being unlimited in his power. Now, this is John writing. Now, John's a good man. John is one of the first Christians. He spent his whole life telling people about Jesus and helping people. I mean, he's on the island exiled because of all the things that he's done. Not only this, he was the beloved disciple of Jesus. He was one of Jesus' best friends. But Jesus' appearance and vibrance is so overwhelming, even to John who knew him, that he faints. As Jesus, this transfigured, all-powerful, resurrected version of Jesus, puts his hand on John, and, and it says his right hand. His right hand symbolizes righteousness. And he says to John, John, don't be afraid. It's still me. I have died, but I conquered the grave, John. I have the keys of death and the grave. In other words, Jesus says, I can free anyone from death and sin and all of its power. John, you don't have to be afraid anymore. I'm on your side, whatever happens to you. Later on in chapter 4 and 5, of Revelation, John is shown the scene in the throne room of heaven where all of heaven is gathered. Now, I mean all of heaven, all the angels. Now, think about it. When you read the Bible and the stories of the angels you, you read about, just one angel showing up knocks over the meanest, baddest human military soldiers possible. And they're all together. Each one of these are more powerful than a whole squadron of human forces. And the question is asked, who is worthy? And without getting into the nitty-gritty details, because we don't have the time today. But just when it seems like there is no one worthy to rescue the human race and to end the reign of terror... Jesus shows up. That was, probably, that was his way when he was on earth. Why are we surprised that it's like that in heaven too? And this is what they, the most powerful beings in the universe, say about Jesus. You are worthy, for you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people. Ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them, that's his people, that's us, to become a kingdom of priests for our God and they will reign on the earth. And then John pulling back, he's speaking and he says, Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels the, the King James Version says myriads upon myriads. That means an innumerable number. Just one of these angels can knock out a whole military unit. And there's millions and millions of them all in the one place. And they are around the throne and of the living beasts and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus. Worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Seven things. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea. That's a lot of creatures. And they sang... Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. What I am sharing with you today is just a glimpse, it's just a sliver of a vision of who God is. God the Father is exactly that. He's our dad. He's our heavenly dad. 
Because he created us. Imagine that. Our father in heaven. He is the ultimate father anyone could ever hope for, anyone could ever imagine, except he actually is our father because he's our creator. And while he's not happy about the mess here on earth, he yearns for us. Just like a father would yearn for their child if their child was kidnapped. Imagine if you had a child who was kidnapped and held for ransom. That's how God feels about us. He yearns for us. Just as Jesus defended the woman caught in adultery, a sinner, and some would say adultery is, the, is one of the worst sins. God sees all the sins the same. But regardless, Jesus steps in to defend her because she is a child of God. Just like our kids mess up, and they mess up big time, at the end of the day, they're still our kids. Even when they do the worst things, they're still our kids. And we still love them. That's how God feels about us. God is on our side. And he's even on our side when we scream nasty things at him. Just like what we may have done to our parents. Or maybe our kids sometimes yell nasty things at us. He's even on our side when we say awful things about him. Because he's our dad. Even when Jesus was dying on the cross, Jesus was still trying to defend his kids. The ones who put him there. He loves us so much, so much, that he even sacrificed his life for us, his kids. Not only would he do anything for us, but he has done everything for us. And although we mess up really badly, some of us more than others, it feels like sometimes, he is on our side. And he's, I mean, it's great when we see human fathers and mothers go and they, they defend their kids when something has happened or, or they take care of them. And that's great when that happens with humans, but he's not just a human father looking out for or defending or sacrificing for his kids. He's actually the most powerful being in the universe. You have millions and millions of angels who are powerful bowing down to him saying he's the most powerful. That's our dad. And he's wanting nothing else but to help us, his kids to have the life that he has promised us you know how we sometimes we we those of us who are parents we we just want to give our kids the things that that we think they should have perhaps the things that we never got to have as kids that's god He wants nothing else but to help us have the life that he promised us and to be re reconnected with his lost kids. He's like a parent who had their kids stolen from them and held for ransom. That's how he feels. Do you, did you notice in Revelation 5 verse 10, it says, for you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people? He was the ransom price that the kidnapper wanted. He paid the ransom for us with his own life. And thinking of how we can be God's partner and friend, we can't expect, or even forget even partner friend, just to have somebody want to be a Christian. We can't expect people to properly experience God's presence unless we envision him as the loving guardian who has given up everything to reconnect with us. 
And we can't expect to understand our, our relationship with him as his servants not because we have to do things for him, but because we want to do things for him. We can't get that. We can't even comprehend what salvation means if we don't have the correct picture of him as the all-powerful God who sacrificed himself so that we could inherit his kingdom. Because children inherit from their parents, right? Right? As I finish up, it's our prayer, it's my prayer that you will see God, that you'll see Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit as they truly are, our hero, our protector, our defender, our Father who is in heaven. We now have a musical item for you to listen to.